Well, good evening, everyone. It's wonderful how quiet everybody gets when this. This never happens to me in the classroom, so I think this is. I think this is pretty instructive. I'm really thrilled to be able to welcome you to this dialogue, which is one of a series of conversations that Georgetown's Initiative on Catholic Social Thought in Public Life have organized for the enrichment of our community over the past while. My name is Pat Clunan, and I serve as the Interim Dean of Georgetown University School of Nursing and Health Studies. And it's really an extraordinary honor for me to be here to welcome you all to tonight's panel um, that will focus in a particular way on poverty, access to health care, global hunger, and conflict. The session will also address, I think, the pivotal issues of leadership of women in the church and in society. And in addition, we'll try to offer some reflections about responding to the messages of Pope Francis. We are very, very pleased tonight to be joined by our distinguished panelists, uh, Dr. Carolyn Wu, Sister Carol Keehan, and Sister Donna Markham. Um, I was particularly pleased to be asked to participate in this event for several reasons. First, as you certainly know and understand, uh, our panelists are steadfast leaders whose work gives voice to the poor and those who are marginalized and those who suffer from ongoing conflicts, insufficient access to food and water, inadequate health care, and systemic poverty. Two of our three panelists, Sister Carol and Sister Donna, reflect the enduring contributions that women religious have made in these crucial areas for centuries. Um, in fact, and here comes a shameless plug for the School of Nursing and Health Studies, get ready, um, our school um, came into being in 1903 due to the vision and the dedication of members of the Sisters of St. Francis. So we hold a particularly warm spot in our heart for women religious. The Sisters of St. Francis, back at the turn of the last century, hoped to educate a nursing workforce to improve the health and well-being of those in our local communities who were served by Georgetown's hospital. 112 years later, in 2000, uh, 2015, our school's impact has actually expanded significantly, not only um, locally but also globally in the care of people who are ill around nursing care, laboratory sciences, health systems, population health, and health policy, which from my perspective is an extraordinary reflection of our founders' enduring legacy. I'm also quite honored to be part of this event because of the extraordinary and palpable enthusiasm by the recent visit of Pope Francis. I don't know about you all, but at Georgetown we were all hope all the time, and so we were all quite energized and quite jazzed. And I think many of us felt a sense of renewal because of his particular attention and focus on the needs of the poor. This university, this extraordinary place in which we are all gathered, through our educational activities, our research endeavors, and our meaningful collaborative partnerships with our community agencies, I think we pr provide a particularly strong combination of active engagement in the world as well as sort of reflective and contemplative questions that ask us to think more thoughtfully and carefully about our commitment to service of the poor and underserved. Our campus activities around the environment, around health disparities, community-based engagement again at the local, national, and global level, levels really provides this university with an extraordinary opportunity to serve the common good of society, particularly and especially um, those who have been marginalized and have been underserved. One of our uh, Jesuit traditions that we speak um, quite explicitly and passionately about is this notion of magis. Our president, Dr. DeJoya, talks about magis, which basically suggests that we should never be happy kind of resting on our laurels. There's more to do, there's more energy, there's more opportunities for co commitment, collaboration, and engagement. And I think one of the more tangible ways in which our university has demonstrated their commitment to MAGIS is our initiative on Catholic social thought in public life, which is hosting this dialogue. It's our extraordinary fortune to have John Carr scribbling away over there um, as uh, the director, sorry, I really, um, the director of our <laughs> initiative. <laughs> Um, 
always a teacher, John. I could always look in the back row. Um, John brings to Georgetown really quite an extraordinary background, uh, working um, as the director of the Department of Justice, Peace, and Human Development at the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. He's worked at the White House Conference on Families and is director of the National Committee for Full, um, Full Employment. He will moderate tonight's session and I'm sure will give us all really powerful insights as we think about how to frame this conversation moving forward. Again, I welcome our panelists, Sister Carol Keehan, who is president and CEO of the Catholic Health Association, Sister Donna Markham, who is president and CEO of Catholic Charities USA, and Dr. Carolyn Wu, president and CEO of Catholic Relief Services. Please join me in offering our panelists a warm welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Pat, for uh, those words and introduction and for your leadership. You're also a woman who leads here at Georgetown and many other places. Uh, my role here, I think I'm the token male on the panel. Uh, most guys are not familiar with that role. I look forward to it. Uh, I thank you for coming on this, uh, at this busy time, this beautiful day. I'm particularly thankful for some of the students who come from uh, Stone Ridge Visitation and Holy Cross. Uh, the initiative, and I hope you picked up our new annual report, our second year, we've, we've had a great time. We've done a dozen initiatives, a dozen dialogues, many of them from the stage. We've had the President of the United States, we've had the Pope's Chairman of the Council of Cardinals, we've had Brooks and Shields, we have the American Federation of Labor, Progressive, the American Enterprise Institute, Conservative, we've had the head of the EPA and all sorts of people, but this is a dialogue that I have been looking forward to for a long time. I, because of who these people are, what they do and how they serve uh, the least of these. They are great examples of the gospel at work and our social teaching in action. And I think they in many ways represent uh, the vision, the message that uh, Pope Francis has been trying to uh, challenge us to follow in our church and society. Uh, in the joy of the gospel, Francis said, I prefer a church which is bruised, hurting, and dirty because it has been out on the streets rather than a church which is unhealthy from being confined and from clinging to its own security. The church needs most today is the ability to heal wounds and to warm the hearts of the faithful. It needs nearness, it needs proximity. I see the church as a field hospital after battle, Pope Francis said. He also said in addressing a group of women in Rome, the, he spoke of the indispensable contribution of women in society, in particular with their sensitivity towards the other, the weak and the unprotected. I strongly hope that these responsibilities can be further opened up to the presence and acti activity of women, both in the church as well as in the public and professional spheres. So here are women leaders who bring together that option for the vulnerable, the field hospital, and the leadership of women in the church. These are the women who actually lead the field hospitals and put our faith into action and serve the common good. So the first question I'm going to ask them, because I think they represent in so many ways uh, what Pope Francis is calling us to, is what they saw as Pope Francis <laughs> made his way from Washington to New York to Philadelphia. I'm just going to say an additional word. You've heard the formal titles, but Sister Donna is the newest part of this triumvirate. Uh, less than a year, I think, is uh, four months. Four months, well. Uh, in Washington, that makes you an expert. Uh, uh, one really important thing to know about Sister is she is a Dominican. And she has served as a prioress of her community uh, and did so for six years. She is the first 
woman president of Catholic Charities in 105 years. And <laughs> we know Catholic Charities, you may not know that it serves 9 million people in this country struggling with poverty. She comes to this position with a distinguished academic and professional career. Uh, her background is in psychology. She has been president of the Behavior Health Institute for the Mercy Health System. Uh, she has academic credentials. She's been at Northwestern. She served briefly here at Georgetown as uh, director for leadership initiatives and an assistant to President Jack DeJoya. Uh, one of the things I've learned about Sister is she has a particular effort to help Dominicans in Iraq, having been there twice, watching out in people in that desperate situation. So she is not someone who sits, you know, in a clinic or in an office, but she goes where the needs are in dramatic ways. You've seen her at the National Press Club, you've seen her before Congress. Uh, I think Washington sister doesn't just need, you know, your, your leadership as an advocate for the poor and all that. I actually think your professional training could help. Maybe. <laughs> Group therapy. <laughs> just think about the last few weeks. We had John Boehner's tears. We had Paul Ryan's reluctance. We had Joe Biden's. Uh, amazing, impressive anguish over the right thing to do. Uh, those were, I think, amazing displays of humanity. We've had some less attractive things. We have what's going on the campaign trail. Uh, and we have what we watch today in so many days in Congress as uh, people, you were an expert in organizational behavior and change. We could use some of that here in Washington. So. You could help us see the poor as our sisters and brothers, and maybe with your training, you could help Washington work again. What did, what did you see in Pope Francis? I actually think you had a chance to visit with him personally. I did, yeah. Part of what struck me, you know, uh, right after the Pope addressed Congress, he went straight from Congress to Catholic Charities in D.C. to uh, one of our places that serves homeless folks. And, uh, and to watch him, and we had a plan. Monsignor Ensler and I were to greet him, and we were supposed to take him to the tables to meet the people. And all the folks were seated at their tables. Lunch was ready. The Pope was to say uh, grace, and we were to escort him. Well, he walked through the door, walked straight into the middle of the room, and was swarmed immediately by the homeless, so the whole program was gone, you know. Uh, but what was so beautiful, uh, what was so beautiful was to watch that uh, kind of juxtaposition where he had come from speaking to, to our government leaders, our Congress, to go from that to walk into this where he allowed all these folks to touch him. Uh, he, it was the first time, I think, that he had actually been that close to people, the Secret Service went crazy, uh, but they just let this happen. And uh, when he talked to the people there, he said uh, that we, he talked to the parish, and he said, we must see the face of Christ in the poor and continue to respond joyfully to their knocks on our doors. And that's exactly what he did. So for me to witness that, I was, very, I was as close as I am to John, um, and, but I, at that point, knew that it was not a moment for me to say anything but to back away and let the folks be with him. It was far more important for him to be with them and for the people to be with him than it was for me. So I resigned myself to the fact I wasn't going to see him. Uh, and that was fine. I wasn't going to talk to him. And I was surprised uh, when I was in New York at our Catholic Charities Immigration Center when uh, Archbishop Ozek came up to me and he said, can you be at the, uh, the, the nunciature uh, to the UN at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning? And I said, sure, you know. Uh, and so he said, you're going to meet the Pope. And I did. And um, it was quite an experience. I, he doesn't speak a lot of English and my Spanish went 
I said a few things in Spanish and got totally panicked and overwhelmed and thought, well, this is, you know, so uh, I was able to thank him for all that he has done to raise awareness of all of humankind to the plight of those who are dispossessed and on the margins. And I also was able to thank him for what he is doing to try to heal the hurt of the American sisters. And so that, and then he gave me his blessing. Carolyn Wu, as you know, is uh, the president and CEO of Catholic Relief Services, which is in on five continents, about 100 countries, serving 85 million people in our name with some of our money. Uh, what you may not know is that she was born and raised in Hong Kong. Uh, she was educated by the Marian Old Sisters, who I've heard her say, taught her uh, that God was real. Uh, she immigrated here uh, as a young woman, went to Purdue, and uh, got several degrees there, joined the faculty. And then a priest by the name of Father Ted Hesper encouraged him to go to a small university in Indiana, uh, South Bend, I think. Uh, and uh, she had just a stunning career there, ended up as chair of the business school, one of the leaders in ethics and business. I got to know uh, Carol, Carolyn, when she was one of the first lay members of the CRS board. And here was, please don't take this badly, but here was this very direct, candid uh, dean of a business school, a woman, uh, not a cleric, who was sort of explaining how the world worked. Uh, to the bishop members of the, uh, the board, and uh, I thought, how would they like that? Well, they apparently liked it a lot, because they went and asked her to serve as president and CEO, and for the last three years, she has been the leader of CRS, which I think is one of the proudest things we can claim as Catholics, is that in our name, they are serving the least of these. She's been on a lot of boards, uh, she actually served some on the review board in Baltimore, which can't be easy. I got to know her a little bit on the International Policy Committee. Remarkably, she was one of only five presenters in Rome when the Pope's encyclical on environment uh, was mentioned. I think you were the token female on that panel. Uh, she's married, she has two children, two sons, she works at the, uh, she worships at the Shrine of the Assumption in Baltimore. Foreign Policy named her as one of the 500 most powerful people on the planet and one of only 33 who was a force for good. So, <laughs> <laughs> so one other force for good is uh, Pope Francis, what did you see, what did you hear, how did he challenge us in terms of the ministry of CRS? Sure, uh, but by the way, I just want to say this foreign policy recognition is not really for me. I was just in the job for a year, so clearly it was not for what I did. But it's really for the work of CRS over 70 years and also acknowledging the role of the U.S. Catholic Church. Uh, we are the official arm of the U.S. Catholic Church out in the world. So just please really enjoy your honor to uh, being recognized as one of the 33 forces for good. By the way, the other Catholic so recognized is the Pope. So uh, the U.S. Catholic Church is in good company. Um, I love the Pope. Um, I think I've now met him four or five times. Um, I don't speak any Spanish, and whenever every time I greet him and he greets me, I always say, I'm praying for you. I said, pray for me, and he would say, pray for me too. That's always our exchange. Um, you know, reflection on the Pope is so rich. He says so much, taught us so much. But I just want to say three ways he has affected me and challenged me. I think one of the points that he has is to not be afraid. Um, we, I think, are not mean-spirited people, um, but sometimes we act out of our fear. Uh, we don't like strangers, for example. We don't like people who disagree with us. Um, when we give, we are fearful of, you know, whether we would have enough. 
But I think his point to us over and over again is, uh, do not let the fear get the better part of you. Go, go out and go out and engage in part of that, losing that fear is because if we really believe in God, that's where uh, our courage comes from. And so I think he encourages us to do that. Uh, the second point, which is sort of a major issue that I have to work out for myself, and I pray a lot about it, is that I think he really challenges us about how we live, um, how we share, how we deal with sort of the plentifulness in our own lives, and how do we turn to the people who are the very poorest, who are at the margin. Um, I think his encyclical, Laudato Si, is not just about the environment, it's about relationships. Um, it's about how we um, relate to God, how we relate to neighbors, and how we relate to the world of things and creation. And so for me, it's sort of that whole sense about, I think most Americans have too much. And I definitely think I have too much. But letting go is not easy. And when I think about the Pope, I think about the challenge to ourselves and what we hold on to and what we're willing to give away. And I think it's the most difficult thing. I think that's an area which I often tell God, I'm sorry I'm not there. Um, I don't even see a path to go there, but if God does miracles, that is the part in my life I think that needs the most work. The third and final thing I think about the Pope is that I just have this feeling I don't want to let this man down. <laughs> uh, he worked so hard while he was in the U.S. He did have sciatica. He was you know, not comfortable sitting or walking or whatever it was, but there he was. Not only did he have a full formal agenda, he also had a lot of unscheduled visits that he also did. Um, he never missed a chance to be greeting people to go out to them. He put himself out there. I mean, this is a person who is not scripted at all. He speaks from the heart and he lets his, the Holy Spirit guides him. Um, and he's right out there, I think, helping us really sort of comprehend the faith. And I just have this feeling that I just don't want to let this man down. Um, I don't want his visit to be a one-time event. Asterius is working on a big program called <coughs> Island Climate Change. Um, starting in January, we have new materials every two weeks. And it's the whole idea that I don't want his work to just sort of go away or his impact in this trip want to build from it just so that the message is heard. So those are the three things, to not be afraid, to look more deeply in the way that we live, and does it really reflect sort of the love that God asks us to live in? And the third thing is to not let him down. Well, don't let him Well, somebody who will not let Pope Francis down is Sister Carol Keon. Sister Carol was uh, born on Capitol Hill, I believe, raised in Southern Maryland. She's a Washington product. Uh, she is president and CEO of the Catholic Health Association of the United States with 1,200 uh, Catholic health care entities, hospitals, and assisted living and care. They serve 5 million people, some of us. Uh, our aches and pains and new parts of our body came from a uh, Catholic hospital. She worked for many years in uh, the leadership of the Daughters of Charity. That's a really important thing. Just as sister is an Adrian Dominican, she is a daughter of charity. I got to know her when we both were close to Cardinal Hickey, where she was the leader of Providence Hospital, which is just a wonderful example here in Washington of Catholic health care ministry at work. She's on the board of this university, on the board of CRS. She's on committees at the Bishops' Conference where we work together. She was named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People in the World. So you need to get on one of these lists. <laughs> <laughs> That'll come. But, and then she was named, she's always on the list of 100 Most Influential People in Healthcare. And in 2007, she was named the most powerful person in healthcare. So if you have any problems whatsoever with, <laughs> with your healthcare. So I've seen her at the White House, I've seen her at the Vatican, I've seen her at the Bishop's Conference, but I've also seen her elsewhere. Sister lives with a community of the daughters at Seton High School in Bladensburg, near my home. Uh, we both show up when we're not traveling at the old people's mass. At, 
4.30 at St. Ambrose. Uh, I first got to know Sister Carol when we were both younger. Uh, she was the head of the Center for Life at Providence, which said to young women in this city who were alone, who were afraid, who were thinking about having a baby by themselves, that there was a future, that there was hope for them. And so for, from those days to now, she has put into practice the church's teaching about life and dignity. She has been around for a couple papal visits. Uh, what did you see? What did you hear? And what do you think it means for the healthcare ministry of our church? Uh, thank you, I think, John. <laughs> uh, first, let me just say, set one thing straight. People can hardly resist announcing that Time Magazine chose me as one of the 100 most powerful people in the world. And it sounds really classy, I know. Think about it and look at the list. It's me, it's Lady Gaga, <laughs> there are a couple of dictators. <laughs> it is not the communion of saints. <laughs> now, I, I, I use that line all the time when I'm introduced that way. And then all of a sudden, a couple years ago, Cardinal Dolan got on. So I have to try to find a way to revise that line, so don't tell him. <laughs> but um, I, I, I want to first echo Sister Donna and Carolyn, who really did capture a great deal of, uh, of the, the incredible visit of our Holy Father. I, I was over the moon. I, I, um, I am just so incredibly um, grateful to God for this man. And uh, believe me, I'm up, I was up at 3 o'clock in the morning to drag myself down to walk into the White House on the lawn there and, and um, be there when he got there, do the same thing for Congress the next day. And it was an absolute joy to do it. When you listen to our Holy Father, whether he was talking to the Congress, to the United Nations and, and all the leaders of the, of the world, or he was talking to prisoners, or as Sister Donna described him, he captivated them. He captivated their hearts. Have we, you know, when have we had such an incredible example of someone who shows God's love so well to whoever you are, wherever you are, and while he doesn't say, oh yeah, everything you do is just fine, sweetie, he calls you to be your very best self. And in, in differing, he differs in a way that calls us to be what we're called to be, to, be, to, have, to bring out the greatness in each of us. What an incredible lesson that is for us who when we disagree and want to show you how miserable your stupid opinion is and how unworthy it is of humanity. And he doesn't do it that way. And you watch the incredible sensitivity that he showed in Congress. When he didn't come and tell Congress what to do, although he had been invited to, he came and told Congress about how many great Americans we had whose example is an example for all of us. What an incredible way to deal with that, with that situation. And so, you know, I have this picture from the White House of this big limo driving up, Mr. President and Mrs. Obama standing outside, flags flying on the car. The big old limo drives up, drives right past the President and his wife. And this little dinky Fiat drives up, you know, and that is just so typical of this, of this Pope. And why you could say, well, listen, I mean, he didn't have to do that. He didn't, but he, the symbolism, the sensitivity, um, and the incredible love he has for so many people, whether you are only halfway there in terms of being willing to give and being willing to be to follow all the commandments, or whether you're the most pious person in the church. He loves you, and he wants you to know how much God loves you, which is so important. And there is just such a great lesson to be learned when we try to help people bring out the greatness 
in them that God has planted in them. I, I just think it is a very, very different way. And, and I would hope, in addition to, as Carolyn says, that we never let him down, and certainly if, if all we can really do for him is to pray, that's a great deal, I and mean, it's what he asks for most, that we could all learn, especially me, to learn to differ with people by calling forth the best that God has put in them. I think that is an incredible gift, um, along with his great love for the most disadvantaged. Wonderful. Wonderful memories. Uh, I think you were at the school in Harlem, weren't you? Yes, I was. Uh, there are lots of deeply moving, tremendous moments. My favorite moment is when the little girl said to him, you have to double click <laughs> when she was trying to teach him uh, how to use the board. Uh, let's get to, uh, here you are, three women, 100 most powerful this, first in 105 years, you're working in an institution that is run by ordained men in very significant ways. What is your experience? Uh, are you listened to? How do you make a difference? What would you say to the young women in this audience and who might be listening in on how they can be leaders? How can their convictions and talents be used? How can they make a difference? What has been your experience and what lessons have you learned as women leaders in a church that is run to a significant degree by ordained men. And you come, came really from outside the church in some ways. You're a believer, your faith journey is incredible. But you come in some ways from the world of business. What, what is your take on this challenge? John, actually there are two parts in this because I follow your questions and organize my thinking that way. One is how do you get people to take you seriously um, not just as a woman, but as an outsider and as a Chinese woman. Um, and the second one is, what are the drivers of leadership? I think they're related, but I want to go into the first one. Um, I thought about this. When I was 22 years old as a graduate student, I taught 22 years old undergraduates. When I was 30 years old, I taught executives in executive education. So the whole idea is, how do you get people to take you seriously I think a number of things is that I work really hard. Um, so when I go into a situation, I am really prepared. But the second thing is that I set very high expectations for myself and for the people I come across. If it is my students, I set very high standards for my students. And that's because um, the teachers, the Marinal sisters who are Dominicans, set very high standards for us. We were just these Chinese girls. How did I come into my English skill, for example? Not because they coddle us, um, but because they really held us to very high standards. I remember when I was young, I had to go debate. I was captain of the debate team, British uh, schoolboys. And I told the nuns, I said, that is not fair because I am not a native speaker, but they are. And they said, Carolyn, why does that matter? Why does that matter? You will just have to prepare, and you will just have to do your very best. So I think the second thing is, high standards is everything to me. I think also because I'm an educator and also because I believe that when you really believe in someone, you know what they can become. When you hold low standards for someone, it's actually because you don't believe in them. And so I do, I hold myself to it and I hold other people to it. And I think that's why, um, you know, somehow I'm always put in these positions, even when I was kind of young to, work with a group. When it comes to leadership, I have to be very honest, I never, never had a goal to be a leader. Um, I, when I was young, I just needed to pass my exams. Um, I went to college because I was concerned about how, who would provide for my parents. They were migrants, uh, there was no social security system, and they relied on their children, and that was, I was part of their children, and how would I make a living to support my family? That was the goal when I started. Um, and then as you get into work, just like I said, I like work well done. Because I think there's actually a certain aesthetics to work well done, so I enjoy that. I only had one year of tuition, so I learned to pack a lot of courses. I packed 
42 credit hours into my first year um, because it was like shopping. If you only had one chance at it, what you would do. And so it was just learning to make use of opportunities and not take anything for granted. Um, I think the other part about leadership is don't do it for yourself. If you do it for a cause you really believe in, and I really believe um, in CRS, I really believed in Purdue University and Notre Dame, what we stood for, do it for the cause and do it so that other people could do the best work so that they could be worthy um, of the people who are entrusted to you, whether they're students, whether they're the poorest of people, uh, there's a responsibility to them. And so that's my leadership story. Wow. Kenny, you're the first female president in 100 years. <laughs> uh, you're enormously well prepared. You've done a lot of things in religious life. What is it like being a leader in the church when you're a woman? Well, I'll start uh, with a, a kind of a funny story. Uh, when I was 26 years, 26 years old, I finished my PhD. And uh, I was going to be uh, starting uh, working in a hospital in the, in the psychiatric unit with the severely mentally ill. And I got a telephone call from the director of the seminary, the major seminary in Michigan, and said that uh, the priest who was to teach psychology had fallen ill and would I be willing to, to teach in the graduate school, pastoral psychology. I said, sure. So I got out there, and the dean of the school, the rector, asked me. The dean said, how are you going to teach them? They're never going to take you seriously. Because it, it was all men, of course. You know, they, and I said, well, I'll do my best. And, uh, and so uh, it, was, it was a funny ride, but it worked out really well. And what it said to me was, going to something that Carolyn said, we have to be extremely uh, uh, hardworking with with high standards for ourselves and do the very best job that we can and not to be intimidated by what anyone says and to do to do the work because that's what we've been asked to do and to do it to the best of our ability and uh, I, I worked at the seminary uh, for five years and uh, uh, loved it and uh, was also working on the staff of the hospital a Jewish teaching hospital and so I was in a lot of different worlds. I also was then uh, later on asked to become the president of the Southdown Institute in Canada, which is a treatment facility for distressed church professionals. And uh, they'd always had a priest as the CEO, and they couldn't find one. And so, uh, so they said, well, you know, maybe you should apply. And, so, uh, and then uh, two other people that applied with me were both priests who were my students and my, my supervisees. And so they, when they found out that, they, uh, that I was applying, they said, well, don't pick us. You know, she's the one that taught us everything we know. So it was really funny, but it was one of those kind of serendipitous moments. Um, and, um, and in terms of being taken seriously, I don't feel that I've ever really, uh, uh, run into difficulty in being taken seriously once someone knows who I am and what I do. I think it's that first hurdle. Sometimes it's difficult for us as women to move uh, beyond, but then to claim to claim the uh, God-given gifts that we have and to offer those gifts as freely as we can. In terms of style of leadership, I have learned that I think my style of leadership has been somewhat different from some of my male predecessors in various positions. Uh, and I think it, it reflects uh, being uh, highly relational, uh, banking on a, a, a team of really strong folks and trusting the team and knowing that we're all in this together and not needing to be, uh, not needing to be uh, uh, the only one making a decision. So a uh, collaborative decision-making style based on the collective wisdom of the group is really important to me, and I think that's been uh, a part of the joy of being in leadership, and I think in some ways it's something that we, we women learn early uh, in, in our lives, how to get along, how to count on each other, 
even how to uh, get help from each other when we're writing our doctoral dissertations or having to teach class. We used to trade notes to, so we, we wouldn't have to do, uh, we could only do a third of the work. We'd have our colleagues do some of it and we'd all trade. Uh, but it's that kind of working together that I think is a real gift uh, in leadership today. And I think it is something that women are, uh, are really, uh, Often able to to offer to the uh, to the to the uh, work environment wherever that may be. Sister Karen, what? <laughs> I'm stunned that a faculty member would use someone else's notes. Oh, we did. We traded them all the time. <laughs> uh, your lessons, your experience, your advice on this topic. Well, you know, the, the first thing I would say is. Um, be competent. I think Carolyn's words are really, really ring true. Um, nobody should take a job that they're not competent at. And so it's important to, to develop competencies and, and to work, really work hard at that. Um, I would also say as you, do, as you take different roles on your way up, don't be so focused on your way up as you are on the group's way up, because there are lots and lots of people, and I, you know, I, I have a hospital mentality, so you just have to forgive that, um, that you can help, whether, you know, I might be becoming the CEO, but if I help somebody who is a dietary aide get back to school and get a different kind of, a, you know, a, a better paying job and a, and, and better able with her education now to help her children, or somebody who's a, a nurse aide, help her and move to being an LPN or an RN. All of us move together. And I think um, one of the greatest things that helps you in leadership is when people are together. You, are, you really are a team, not just in, in, in language, but you really are, and people know that you're, you really care about them and what's happening. Now, I come out of a very different background that's advantaged in terms of leadership in healthcare. If you stop and think about history in this nation at a time when women didn't have any jobs, you either were a nurse or a teacher in, in um, grammar school or high school, you didn't have any jobs in business. You didn't, and sisters didn't even go out of the house, didn't eat in restaurants. I mean, never mind deal with the business world. At that time, in the history of women and in the history of women religious, women religious in the United States built the largest, most successful healthcare system the world has ever known. <laughs> I stand on their, their shoulders, um, and, and I am profoundly impressed by them. I would also say to you, it helps if you have brothers, because, you know, we are a, a male church, uh, you know, the leadership of the church is, is male, and sometimes men don't say things the same way. I mean, I had a, a brother who, it, I think it, Humanizing me was probably his only contribution to humanity. <laughs> and you know what I mean if you have a brother. You know, you would get dressed, you would think you were, you just looked like the, you know, the, just the, the top of the line. You'd come down the stairs and he'd look up very casually like he just happened to notice you and say, you're not wearing that, are you? You planned for three weeks what you were going to wear and poof. When you, and, and I can remember one time, uh, because I've had some incredibly wonderful relationships with the, with the men in our church, in, particularly in the hierarchy. Uh, certainly John alluded to Cardinal Hickey, who um, could not have been kinder. Cardinal McCarrick, my dear, dear friend, who no matter how beaten and battered I am, always says, I'm her friend. <laughs> um, certainly Cardinal World, and, and many, many, priests and bishops across this country and at the Vatican. So I have to say I have been very well treated for the, for the most part. 
Um, I, I would say sometimes, I remember one time uh, uh, an archbishop calling me because there was a press consternation over something that some of the bishops said and I said something different. And he called me and I was at the airport getting ready to get on a plane to go to Rome and it was, what did you say that for? And I'm explaining why I said that for and why I was right what I said. Finally, <laughs> you know, because it was in the newspaper, it was on the TV and on the radio. Finally, he said to me in ex utter exasperation, well, what would the TV and the media and the newspapers even care what you think for? And, and you know, I, 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 he just didn't get it. I mean, it wasn't me. He was a nice guy. I said, I represent all 635 Catholic hospitals, all 1,400 nursing homes and 1,300s. He said, oh, yeah, I get it now. <laughs> so, you know, you just don't get, don't get your back up. There are just too many good people in the world. Um, and, and if there, if every once in a while, if there's a little lemon in the tea, put a sugar in it. <laughs> church direction. Um, I think there is also a lot of stereotypes. I think my husband is 100 times more patient than I am and uh, grew up excelling in team sports when I, I'm not a sports person, so not to mention team sports, but we are brought up in a Chinese culture in our school to win together, um, that you know the community and the the, the family really matters. But I think that sometimes it's hard because I think that sometimes we, sometimes we use stereotypes and I, about men and uh, I have so many, most of my mentors and the people who gave me a hand up were men. But the second thing I want to say about the church and that is I love the church not because it is perfect. I love the church because I used to wonder why God, knowing all of our foibles and all of our smallness and our pettiness and our selfishness, why did God choose us to be his body on this earth? But now I actually kind of enjoy it. Um, it's sort of like, you know, there, it, when, when Jesus looked at his disciples and the apostles and said, you know, you are me in the world, what did he see? What did he see? And that's always what I hold in my head now is, what did Jesus see in us? And there's just a, such a wonderful mystery, not just the, the parts that don't go right, uh, but just trying to recover what is it in us that Jesus saw and say, be me in this world. So. If, uh if we Googled each of you, uh, we would find a lot of things, very complimentary, you know, most powerful this, most holy that. We'd also <laughs> find sort of two paradoxical uh, uh, views. One group would say, you're entirely too Catholic. You're not with the sexual revolution. You don't get the progressive movement. You don't understand reproductive rights. And so uh, they want to set some rules about who you hire, what benefits you provide, what services you provide. The ACLU is in Michigan trying to force Catholic hospitals to do abortions. There'd be people who would want to keep you and CRS out of foreign aid because of uh, <coughs> what you will do and won't do and the same with charity. So one, one message is you're entirely too Catholic and we'd be better off without those rules. The second paradoxical message is you're not Catholic enough. Sort of self-appointed uh, arbiters of orthodoxy say because of uh, federal money or lack of fidelity or you haven't been formed well, that you're not faithful enough to the teaching of the church, that you would compromise on fundamental uh, issues. Uh, these are not abstract issues. These are everyday realities. So uh, let me turn to Donna. This is something you arrive in Washington and you've got an HHS uh, mandate, you've got legislation on the Hill, you've got the courts, you've got Supreme Court decisions, and then you've got lots of people saying you're not the right person because of something you did 20 years ago and 
do or didn't do. Yeah, I have some stories about that yeah. too. But uh, how do you navigate this faithfully, effectively, in ways that reassures the people you serve that you are the field hospital of the church? Well, I think one of the things that that uh, that has always stayed with me is that uh, I have to be grounded in the gospel. And I have to be, I have to pray, I have to, I have to start my day and end my day in prayer. I have to listen to what uh, God is saying to me through the gospel, what Jesus is saying to me. Uh, I know that back in 1910 when Catholic Charities was first founded, we, in the, in the uh, Catholic Charities movement, decided that we would be the attorney for the poor that that gets you into messy areas because poor folks are in the streets. Their lives are not in tidy boxes and, and all in neat. Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of mess uh, in suffering. And uh, if, if we allow ourselves to be uh, shaken in our clarity around what is the right thing to do for the sake of people who come to us for help, because somebody might criticize us. I think that's really, uh, that would be a tragedy. And I know for myself, I, I won't do that. Uh, I will go back to Catholic social teaching. I will be grounded in it as much as I can possibly immerse myself in prayer and the gospel and know that with, uh, with good counsel uh, that we do the right thing we do the right thing for people who are suffering, for, for people that are in, uh, uh, in the field hospital. And we're going to get, we're going to take some shots. Catholic Charities did starting back in 1910 when we started doing adoptions. That wasn't supposed to, that wasn't very Catholic back then. Uh, so there were all sorts of, and there, there are lots of examples that would be too long to go into now, but where we've had to just say, no, this is the, this is the right thing to do because these are God's people and they are suffering. And we are there to help them. We're not there to find out what religion they are, what their sexual orientation is, uh, whether they go to church or not, or what their, uh, you know, we, that's not why we're there. We're there to help them because they come to our door, they knock on our door, and they need help. And if, if we can stay focused on that, I'm willing to take the criticism. Uh, Carol, uh, there are people in this town who would uh, erase conscience clauses that allow CRS to do its work around the world. There are people in this town who would say if you take any federal money, you should uh, not consider yourself Catholic. How does CRS, there are people who have gone after you personally on both ends of the spectrum. How does CRS keep faith with our principles and engage the world? That's, that's a divided world. So several things, when there are these attacks, I actually don't worry too much. It doesn't bother me what people say about me. Uh, I do worry when they say it about CRS because it could affect our ability to really serve. So I would say to the secular critics who said, you know, the Catholics are out of step, they're out of touch. Um, and uh, should we fund them? Um, on that point, our overall response is judge us by the work that we do. Judge us by the way that we keep a promise to the people we serve. And maintain our religious freedom to operate in the areas which does not violate our church teaching. But go ahead, assess us on the basis of the quality. And that's very important. It's a form of accountability, actually. Um, in terms of the people who attacked us and say that we're not Catholic enough, I would say the first two years of being at CRS was difficult. But look, nowadays, several things. First of all, they also say that the Pope is not Catholic enough. <laughs> that. But the second thing is that we are really clear on what the church teachings are, where it interfaces with our activities. There are things we don't do. We do not distribute condoms. We don't... Uh, advocate it, we don't, you know, we stay with the teachings of the church on that. And, you know, we have a governance system. It's not just Carolyn Wu and three colleagues deciding what to do. We have a board, a board of bishops. 
Uh, we also have a special committee, our advisory committee on Catholic identity. We also consult with the Bishop's Conference. So we are also a very consultative. And in the end now, actually, it's a good thing um, in the sense that you do pay attention and say, is, did I violate church teaching? And I think that's always a good thing to ask ourselves, to so not just assume we're always doing the right thing. But on the other hand now is to be able to say this type of criticism um, is destructive. It's actually Archbishop Shapu when the Philadelphia World Meeting of Families donors were criticized. He said this is destructive and it is divisive. Um, and I think that we're now learning to sort of speak back to these particular issues. But at the same time, I think self-reflection is good. I think having governance is good. But just like Sister Donna said, is, you know, again, we work um, in the name of Jesus. We don't just charge out as our own people. And so what we are called to do, I think the gospel is very clear. Sister Carol, you have no, <laughs> you've had no issues in this area. <laughs> No issues to speak of. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think, it, and Carolyn made the point, I think it's an, it, it is important if someone has, a, has a, a challenge for us, whether we're too Catholic or not Catholic enough, if they're asking that question or raising that concern in good faith to listen. Because just like has been pointed out, this Holy Father pushes us to do more. You know, yeah, you're doing a lot of good, but could you do more? We have a new need, you know, we have, we look at Syrian refugees, look at the refugees from, from all over. Uh, could we do more? Is there more we could, could we stretch ourselves? You know, when you say, you know, we're, we're, um, we're too Catholic, are we too harsh in the way we talk about things? Are we too, um, you know, that our Lord talked in the gospel about putting burdens on people that they could never carry? Uh, are we too um, self-righteous in the way we talk about teachings of the church? Um, and, and so if, if people are asking that in good faith, okay, let's, let's think about it, let's look at it. If people are asking about it, and, and I, I must say we have uh, in our society and in our church people who do not appear to be asking it in good faith, who seem to make it their favorite indoor sport to be shooting at folks for being too uh, to being too Catholic or being not Catholic enough, and their <coughs> tactics are all the same. And so that's when you have to say our focus is on the needs of people. If we if we could be found by our Lord walking in on us when we're doing what we're doing, if we could explain it. If we could say, um, you see, I, I'm doing this because of what I've read in the Gospels. I'm doing this because of the beauty of uh, social teaching of our church. I don't think we have to pay attention to those. And it would be better if we didn't let ourselves be upset. Now, I will say that we do have to stand together at times as church. And Carolyn and I have had some experience with this when people... They don't, you know, people can go after me, they can go after Carolyn, but when they start to go after our staff, that's when we can. When they start to undermine the faith of people who believe in the mission of Catholic health care, Catholic relief services, or Catholic charities, and try to make people of goodwill, people who write a check for $5 every two months out of their social security because they believe in the work of the church. And to undermine that, to, to create, it's not that the five dollars is going to make all the difference in the world, but their prayer, their faith, their support makes all the difference in the world. And to undermine them and, and to give them a sense that the church is off base. To give a sense today that our Holy Father is off base. I think, it, you know, I haven't been able to decide to sin against the Holy Spirit, but I think we're getting close. Uh, you know, this is wrong, and we have to find ways to stand together and say, if you have a concern, we'll hear the concern. But we are not going to allow that kind of behavior. That is antithetical to everything the church stands for.
I'm going to call on Donna for another comment and two things that I want to ask you. One, if you want to join us uh, in terms of the dialogue online, we're at hashtag CSD dialogue, hashtag CSD dialogue, and we're going to move to questions. So if you could bring the mic forward uh, and uh, line up. But first, I want to talk to invite Donna to make a comment on, on that. One comment about uh, the people on, uh, that say we're not, uh, we're not Catholic enough because we take federal funding. And I just want to give you a little reality uh, base on this. Okay, Catholic Charities, 64% uh, of our annual uh, budget aggregated across the country, uh, which is, the, the, the budget is about $4.6 billion in services given to 9 million people. Okay, 64% of that is from federal, is from some, some part of federal funding. 7% of our revenue comes from the church. And the rest of it comes from folks who donate. So 64% from, from, from government funding for food security, for housing, for disaster relief, for education, for uh, mental health care. All right, so, so people, and so then it's like, if we were to say we will not, and some, and some people have said, you know, Catholic Charities should take no federal money. If we did that, what would happen to those nine million people? Is the church gonna make up for that? Can, can we really say that, that we're gonna raise 64% of that budget, not engaging with, our, with government funding? So those are the, that's the reality, and there are some places in across the network that will, that will refuse federal funding. So it's really, it is a complicated issue, but just when you hear those numbers and say only 7% of our revenue comes from the church. Well, Catholics pay taxes, so. Yes, Catholics pay taxes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm impressed uh, how brave and better uh, people on the panel are. I, I, I would invite people to come forward. I would invite you to go to hashtag CST Dialogue. But uh, I've had a similar experience. And you said, when it comes after you, it doesn't matter. Well, uh, I was uh, attacked for uh, being a part of some processes with some people who didn't agree with us on everything. And it affected my daughters enormously. They were passing all this stuff around. And uh, my sons less so. We we're talking about a difference between men and women. They didn't seem to care as much. But they sent it to my oldest son, Mike. Uh, and he called me and he said, uh, Dad, uh, how much trouble are you in? And I said, well, it's, it's pretty rough. If I, if I lost my job, I'd have to move in with you. <laughs> And he said, well, I'm not living with some pro-abortion activist. <laughs> I was not, but be careful who you can count on. Uh, I would encourage people to tell us who you are, where you're from, and try to put your question in the form of a question. <laughs> Hi, my name's Jennifer. Um, I'm from around here. I go to Holy Trinity Parish. And um, my question's kind of around um, your roles, leaders, women, and the concept of feminism in the church. So I'm, I consider myself a proud Catholic woman and a proud feminist, and I know that those are two things that are hard to, you know, mesh sometimes. So I kind of wonder, what would you tell um, young women growing up in the church today who want to feel a part of the feminist movement, who feel a huge call into it, but also want to stay true to their Catholic roots and still be a huge part of the Catholic church? Um, as some, as three people who have shown that you can be a female leader in the church and make a difference. You have just signed a question, I guess. Otherwise, they just look at each other. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm Carol, <laughs> Sister Carol, why don't you start? Well, I, I would say um, there are many, many wonderful things about the feminist movement. Many wonderful things. It, like other things, has some, some pieces that perhaps are the lunatic fringe. We have the lunatic fringe in our church, so I'm not offending anybody gratuitously. But we have the lunatic fringe in almost every group we're in. But, but 
um, I think if you take the best of the feminist movement and the best of our church, and, and I always have to remember, we are not in the church because we believe in the pastor or the bishop or the pope. We are in the church because we believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in the Eucharist, and it, all, it always bothers me that we act like there's so much division on the important things in the church. We, we are wholeheartedly in belief. And so if we can, I have a sister who left the church and, and um, she was always on my case and I say, Bobby, it's because you take the rules too seriously. <laughs> but I, I think the thing of it is, is we have to know what are, the, what are the things to take seriously in our faith and in feminism. And we also have to have patience because it is a journey. And remember, we are 6% of the Catholic Church in the United States. We still have women who are Catholics who have no choice in who they marry, who have no choice about genital mutilation. So it, it's, it is the whole church um, and, and the vast cultural differences it is a challenge to bring along, and we want, when we do bring the gift of feminism from the United States, we want to bring the best of it, not all the, the, the junk part. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of people in line. What I'm going to suggest is that two people offer their questions at the same time, and then we invite the panelists to respond. So, if, Mark, if you could ask your question and then the person behind you add yours and then we'll ask the panel to respond. Certainly, thanks, John. I'm Mark Zimmerman, the editor of the Catholic Standard newspaper, the Archdiocese of Washington. And I, you know, the, John, as, as you mentioned, as the speakers have, have said, that Pope has, has used that image of the church as a field hospital. He's, always, he's also emphasized the, the message of encounter. And I wanted to ask all three of you if you could share a story of an encounter with the poor or someone on the margin that just has really shaped you as a woman of faith and as a leader? Okay. If you could add your question and then we'll invite responses. Sure. Um, my name is Jane Vonda Malhotra. Um, I'm a resident here in DC, but I want to um, uh, put forward a question that relates to the ordination of women, which I hope to see in my lifetime. Um, the reason I have hope for it is our wonderful Pope who is politely, um, I think he's taking his papal, papal silence period right now, <laughs> but I know he's about to open the dialogue because he's such a proponent of dialogue. Um, so first of all, I'm grateful to Georgetown for having this dialogue here today. But also I wanted to share that um, when I was 10 years old, I lived in Fort Wayne, Indiana, and I really wanted, I had a calling to serve as an altar server. Um, couldn't do it because it was only for the boys. Over time, um, I talked to the women who were of strong faith in my family, including my aunt, Anne Patrick, who was a nun. And she said, um, they all said, well, you just write a letter to the bishop. So I wrote a letter to the bishop, Bishop McManus, and he wrote me a wonderful letter back and said, I see what you mean, but um, the cardinals in Rome won't allow us to make this change. And that's when all my aunts said, that's called pass the buck. <laughs> um, what I'm hoping for um, is a few women who are great leaders in these beautiful Catholic organizations could talk about what you hope for for the status of women in the church in the future. Two powerful questions. The status of women in the church in the future and an encounter. Uh, with the poor who shape you and your ministry. Come on, two start. Sure. Let me respond to the encounter one, and then if we have time, I'll respond to the second one later. Um, a, a story I'll share with you it happened on uh, Christmas Eve, and uh, I was working in D Detroit, and I was driving, and I always, um, I always do a lot of. Uh, inadvertent sightseeing when I'm driving, because I'm lost all the time. Anyway, I ended up with a flat tire in the core city of Detroit uh, after dark on Christmas Eve. was terrified by myself, and a uh, homeless guy tried, was sitting, uh, was, on, was on the street. This homeless man was there, and he came over to see if he could help me. And he tried to change the tire, and it was too frozen uh, to do it. So um, 
he, he said, well, I'll take you somewhere where you can call, because I didn't have a cell phone at the time, I'll take you somewhere where you can call somebody to come and change your tire. And I thought, this is crazy, but I needed help, and I went with him. And he did indeed take me to a friend of his who had a, a, lived in a, one of the uh, public housing units in, De in Detroit. And I made the phone call, then came back out with me, waited with me till road service came, offered me a cup of coffee from his thermos, and I tried to give him some money to thank him and wish him Merry Christmas, and hopefully he could find a place to stay that would be warm. And he wouldn't take it. And he said to me, just, um, no, I don't need it. Please find somebody who needs it more than I do and give it to him or her. And I was floored. So what happened to me was, as I reflected on him, I thought, first of all, I was ashamed of my own fear. Um, secondly, I was ashamed because I don't know that I would have done the same thing if I'd been, if the roles had been reversed. Um, and then I thought, what a lesson he taught me about um, being kind, no matter how desperate, uh, no matter how uh, uncomfortable, that kindness transcended everything. And that made a, a very profound impression on me. It's probably part of why I loved working with the severely uh, mentally ill. So status of women in the future and or an encounter? I'll go. Um, I could talk about encounter with the poor just because we work sir, 85 to 100 million people who have make less than a dollar 25 cents a day. But I'm going to pass up. That would be the easy uh, question for me to take on. I want to share one experience with encounter and then speak on the issue of my thoughts on uh, you know where we are as a church. Um, my sons told me that when we give to panhandlers and people who are begging, we should have an encounter with them. We shouldn't just give money and walk away. We should ask them what their name is um, and acknowledge and have a greeting. So I did that the one time. It was near Christmas in Baltimore. There was a man uh, begging. Uh, I was very busy, I was walked by, but I thought, oh no, I'm going to turn back. And it was Christmas, so I gave him $20. Uh, and I said, hi, and I'm Carolyn, and what is your name? And he said, uh, my name is Cleo. And I said, well, have Merry Christmas, Cleo. And he said, can I give you a hug? I said, no. It was as intuitive as that. that I just jump. I mean, I could have an encounter where we exchange name and greetings, and I look at him as a person all coached by my two sons, put into practice. But when he said, can I give you a hug, I just, you know, before I could even think, I just said, no. Um, and that cost me a lot of reflection, John. Um, and actually, I just want to say, I don't care whether you're a millionaire or a beggar. I don't know you. Any man who asked me for a hug, you know, I, I, I'd probably say no thing. No, you know, just, um, but I, that was sort of something that um, caused me to reflect and continue to reflect. I think the issue about women ordination, I don't speak for the church, but I would like to speak for myself, and that is, I actually um, experienced the church grace to me, um, not through the formal hierarchy of the church. Uh, yes, I went to Mass and the priests were wonderful. I mean, I went to Mass, I actually didn't know them very well when I was growing up. But I experienced the incredible sort of uh, love of God by the sisters, the people who left their home and invested their lives in me. Um, and when I went to Purdue University, it was, I had no friends, I was a complete stranger, and the Newman Center took me in, so I was nurtured by the community of what's called church. Um, and so I've never seen, you know, I don't think uh, women's ordination is gonna happen in the Catholic Church in my lifetime. 
I think Cardinal Sean O'Malley in a 60-minute interview says, if it were my church, I'd go for it, but this is not my church. And so I don't want the grace that I have experienced of the church, and the grace I think that we're all called for it to, to bring to other people. Um, all the opportunities which have been afforded me, as you can tell, John said, you know, I was the first group of lay people brought into the CRS board. It was before then, Board of Only Bishops. Um, and the acceptance of me as a very outspoken person um, and being recognized for what I could do um, as a woman. So I don't want any of those things uh, in my life, particularly the grace um, of the people of the church to eclipse, uh, to be eclipsed uh, by the women ordination issue. And I think the Pope is also right too when he says, sometimes people look upon the women ordination issue as a power issue. Um, and I think vocations is so much more than just power. You can say, you know, if you're not a priest and you're not a bishop, then you're not a cardinal, and then you're not at the table to make certain types of decisions. I think there is that. But on the other hand, um, I think that there is way to incorporate voice, which I don't think we've done enough in terms of how do we incorporate voice um, and allow people a place at the table without necessarily going through just the ordination question. So that's... Sister Carol? Well, I would say um, the, the one of the encounters that I've had that I've always remembered when I was young, I ran a children's hospital for 10 years and we had... A, Every child that was sick, uh, whether they could afford it or not, was in our hospital, which was a great grace. But we had this one little girl whose mother was pretty much on the street, had no idea who, who the dad was, really in a terrible situation. Um, and she had very bad, very brittle diabetes. And she was in and out a lot, uh, B. And when I finished mass at 7 o'clock, I always made rounds in all the nursing units in the uh, hospital. And they said, B came in last night, and really bad uh, coma, and very, very ill. So well, we stabilized her, and I went in to see her, and she was sound asleep. So she needed to be asleep much more than she needed to talk to me. So I, I went back over to the sister's house and had breakfast and came back, and my unit manager had come in and made rounds. and went in to see B, and at that point B woke up and she looked up at her and she said, Mrs. Hinton, if Sister Carol knew I was here, she'd want me to have a doll. <laughs> so I said, you know, they're so much smarter than we are. But one, one other really profound encounter I had was with Carolyn in the Philippines after Taklaban. We were in Taklaban after the um, typhoon. And we were talking to people who were captains in their little neighborhood and trying to help everybody with a piece of tarp or a little, a few more uh, uh, cups of rice. And this man who was trying his best to help people said to me, I said, how are you doing? He said, my wife and my children are all gone. He said, I was holding my two children and my wife was with me and they were washed away. He said, my children right out of my arms. There was, not, it, it, there was just nothing I could say. And, and, and you looked at him, and what he was focused on was not that until I asked him. What he was focused on was what could he do for this group, this group, this group, and this group. Such selflessness is, um, you know, is overwhelming. When it comes to, to the issues of women in the church, I, our, our ambassador to the Vatican, Ken Hackett, asked me if I would come over and do a talk a couple months ago, being held, sponsored by a number of the embassies, being held at the um, uh, an Pontifical um, University of the Anthonium. I think that's it, is that right, Cardinal Anthonium? For the first time, uh, there's a woman leading a Pontifical University. A very big change. One of the things I think that uh, be not so much talking about uh, ordination is talking about playing a role in the church based on, on um, what the need is. 
there are lots of roles that traditionally have been played by priests that don't need to be ordained. Cardinal uh, McCarrick uh, chose for his chancellor one of the finest women in Washington. And um, she did a magni <clears throat> magnificent job. She keeps trying to retire, and Cardinal World won't let her. So that gives you a sense of, uh, and she's incredibly well thought of by priests, bishops, as well as the lay staff and, 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 and the people of this archdiocese. Uh, and, and so I think if you look at the positions in the church where we can be of service, not so much where we can grab power, I think we're on that road. Um, in terms of ordination, I, I'm not sure that I would say we're on that road yet. Um, and, and I'm not sure that that's in, in my lifetime going to happen. I do think that we're making significant progress. And again, I would point out, we are 6% of the Catholic Church. The women that we have to help raise up don't have control over any part of their lives. I really am very concerned that we use the talents and gifts we have to, to be there. I'm also concerned, though, that when women have the ability to lead, that we use it. Only using 50% of the talent God gave the church is not a good idea. touched by the, the pain of so many women, like the woman who asked the question. And that pain, because there are women who feel deeply called to celebrate Eucharist. And they, and, and they feel that. I do not have that, that call. Um, but I need, I as a human being, and I would ask the church to hear the pain of the women regardless of where that thing, how long that takes, or whether it happens, or whatever else, but to hear the anguish of a, of a woman who feels called to celebrate Eucharist and cannot by virtue of, of her gender. And I think there's something to be said for hearing, hearing that, receiving that, um, and uh, realizing that that is, that is a real source of uh, of, of um, real anguish in the lives of, of some women, many, many of whom I know, uh, and then there are some of us who do, don't have the same call, but I need to hear it. So I, I think that's maybe what we can do uh, as church at this point is to hear. Can I ask the three people in line to share their uh, question? And we'll try and get a comment from our panel, and then we're going to have to wrap up pretty quickly. So. My name is Rachel. I work for Network, the National Catholic Social Justice Lobby. And I was at a retreat this past weekend with Holy Trinity's young adult group. And it was a wonderful time to spend with God and one, with one another. And I got to talking with one of the young adults there about how, and there's some of them here, um, <laughs> about how um, we go, we all go through questioning in our lives, especially within the church, and there are certain things that we may not agree with or and may never agree with. And where is the space in the church to openly question in a safe space? Um, because I haven't necessarily seen that it's kind of like you you have to be sneaky about it and like have conversations and be like oh I, I actually think this but the, it's not what the church thinks um, so how have you found a safe space to question and what do you think um, the church could provide um, to have that safe space because we were thinking okay. like a hey, sorry we were thinking like a Bible study of like questioning or something like that. Thank you. Join us, please. Hi, my name is Andrea Ulrich. I'm from Houston, Texas, and I've since moved here. 
Um, thank you all for being here. You're incredibly inspirational. I consider myself lucky to be here and to listen to you and to rejoice in your accomplishments. My question is on the intersection of faith and leadership. So part of being a good leader is making good decisions. Could you carry us through a specific moment or a turning point when your faith and your relationship with God carried you through a major decision? Okay. Hello, um, my name is Kimberly. I'm a second year medical student here at Georgetown, and I'm also the one of the presidents of the Catholic Medical Association student section. And these last couple months have been really pushing and trying to gain support and promote an organization that my classmates started, the Global Surgical and Medical Support Group. And at every corner, um, I've been confronted with naysayers and those that um, have a lot of um, just, they just don't want to support the group because they're supporting refugees, the Catholic refugees in Erbil, Iraq, working with Bishop Warda, and um, a lot of the problems arise with, oh, it's a conflict zone, oh, it's dangerous, oh, it's politically charged, and as women in leadership of these organizations where you are helping people and communities much like Erbil, how do you respond? to those people and try and turn it around so that you can then get that support. Thank you. Thank you very much. So where is space to question? Where has your faith carried you through a difficult moment of leadership? And how do you respond to uh, the needs of people in danger, refugees? Maybe come to Sister Donna on that one. I know you're personally involved with religious communities in Iraq. Yeah, that, that's an interesting, I know, I know Archbishop Warda and um, I've been there uh, twice and probably going back the third time. I think, uh, and there will be people always that say, are you out of your mind? Uh, and um, there comes that point where again, you, you, I mean I have no desire, I do not feel called to murder them. Uh, <laughs> but I also know that sometimes we have to take a risk because people count on us to be there. And um, I, d I don't know whether, I mean, I, your, your question was not clear to me, like whether you're dependent upon funding, that people don't want to fund you because you're going into that war zone, or, um, or whether it's just saying don't go there because it's a war zone. But, um, but I think there does come that moment where um, we know that it's the right thing to do. And we also know that there are times when it's not the right thing to do. So um, I, I think getting good counsel on that and uh, not letting the naysayers tamp down the enthusiasm to do something that's really important. Okay. Space to question or a situation where your faith carried you through a particularly difficult moment? You want to go for that? Oh, I have a choice. Oh, okay. Space to question or where faith plays a role. Um, I just want to say just the fact that when I decided to leave Notre Dame to come to Sarah's, it was a huge uh, decision. Probably one of the largest in the sense that um, I was very good at what I did at Notre Dame. Um, Sarah's is an international development and I don't have the background in international development. Um, I carried a map of Africa with me for a long time. That was how basic it was. And to lead an organization knowing that everybody knows more than you do. Um, and also the whole idea of, um, I had a very good future. I mean, I had multiple terms coming up and years off after that and retirement in the picture and it's all laid out with, that, with very little risk. Um, but I will be giving up tenure um, in order to do something I've never done before. Uh, that was a very difficult decision, and I actually went through a so second time in my life a major discernment process. I worked with my spiritual director. Um, I started and I told my spiritual director I thought about the pros and cons, but they don't lead me anywhere. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, you're very analytical. Um, if analysis will get you there, you would already have been there. But get off the wavelength of analysis. Just listen to your heart, and in particular, the joys and the fears. And he said, they will come to you, and they will speak to you. 
And so I just want to share that particular journey. Done. <laughs> Why don't I start with the safe space? Um, I think we have to become, you know, in a perfect world, we have the ability to, to, to explore things uh, as we wanted to explore them, um, to make mistakes, to, you know, and, 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 but we all know we're not in a perfect world. And it is true, you get labeled, you get people talk about you, people don't want to, you know, people put you in a box. Um, it's like you're not part of the club. And, and, and truthfully, we need to have the ability, one, to raise questions appropriately. Um, because that's important. Faith is a really important thing. Family is really important. So when we raise questions, we need to be sensitive to how important this is. It's not like saying, I wish we had pork chops instead of fish tonight for dinner. These are really things that deal with people's heart. So we need to learn to raise questions appropriately. We also need to, to have the space to do it, the ability to do it. And sometimes we have to create our own space. Sometimes we have to say, I'm not going to wait for somebody else to find that for me. I'm going to make it for myself. And when I have thoroughly had the opportunity to sort that out with people that I trust and people that will tell me yes, no, where'd you ever get that idea, then, then I'll be prepared to talk about it in a bigger forum. Or I'll know I was so far off base, thank God I didn't tell anybody but my two best buddies, and I have enough on them, so if they ever tell on me, I'll tell on them. Uh, but, but I think it, sometimes we have to take charge of that ourselves and make our own space, our own, um, and that's what friends are for, that's what church is for. You know, find the people in your church where you can, where you can say, well, you know, I always wondered about, and or something that always gets me is, and, and other people, we can talk it through, and try to be able to create a space where you will, that's big enough for people that you know don't agree with you. Because then you're really good at space making, and, and at looking at those things. I would say the hardest thing I've had to do following my faith was to endorse the Affordable Care Act. So that's the end of all, but I have to say, finish. <laughs> I just want to go back to this space. I look at myself and as the party uh, to whom someone wanted to have a conversation with. I think the most important determinant of whether I'm willing to enter into that space is the issue of trust. Um, whether that conversation is allowed to be private, whether that conversation is allowed to be exploratory, that it is listening, um, that positions are not quoted and put out in the public. That, um, so I would say, as Sister Carol said, we could create that space, but that space ultimately is really, it, it is about grace. It is about whether we parties who have very strong but different uh, opinions to come down and hear each other and hear the pains associated with that, that whether that conversation is safeguarded, mm -hmm. uh, that it is private, and that it is not about argument, it is not about winning, it is not about debate. Um, and when you enter into that conversation, it's not just what you want people to hear, but what you are also willing to be able to hear. I think that that is the, the trust and the, the, that is necessary to have the grace for that space. And I think we could pray about it, but I think it takes some risk sometimes to reach out to someone. But I think if you reach out in that spirit and say, what do you need in a way of trust uh, in order to allow that conversation to happen? The, the one comment that I would add to that too is how important it is that it happens, that there is that place. And I'm going to give an example of it because I think um, it, it speaks to that, the importance of finding the safe place. Um, uh, this is uh, about 20 years ago. I was on the general council of my religious institute. My sister came to see me and she said, Donna, I don't know what to do. I'm in love. And I said, so I talked with her for a while. And um, then a little while later, another sister came to me, same issue. So then I'm getting the message. There, there are, are, maybe because I had a background in psych, they were coming, but then I'm thinking, 
there are, there are things happening and no one feels like she can talk about it, similar to what you had stated. So I said, so I, I, I uh, put an ad in the congregation bulletin and said, if there's anybody who wants to come to a meeting at an undisclosed location in the middle of the country for a weekend, uh, if, if you're in love and you want to talk about it and you'll trust your sisters to tell the story, the truth, and you'll maintain absolute confidentiality, uh, and you will never disclose who was at the meeting, and of course, the prior's general at the time was saying, you're not going to tell me who's there. I said, no. So, but anyway, so we held this meeting in the middle of the country in an undisclosed location. <laughs> and there were about 35 sisters. A uh, big congregation, over a thousand of us. Okay, so. Uh, but, 20-something years later, not one of those women left religious life. They all worked it out with each other. And it's the importance, I think, of being able to talk in safety and be able to be absolutely truthful about the experience and know that no one's going to judge you, nobody's going to uh, do harm to you. And in, the, in that safe space that we, we are able to strengthen one another and have the energy and the commitment and the faith for the journey as it unfolds. So I'd say important, go for it, make it safe, do it. In a second I'm going to ask you to uh, once again thank our wonderful panel, but there are just a couple uh, last minute items. One, I want to call to your attention and invite you to our next dialogue, which I think is quite remarkable. It's going to be on uh, the afternoon of Monday, November 2nd at the Georgetown Law School. It'll be the first time the initiative has been at the law school. And it's focused on Pope Francis Environmental Encyclical and particularly the issue of climate change and the poor. And we have a wonderful leader of this effort. It's Cardinal Oscar Rodriguez, who is a good friend of Cardinal McCarrick's but also a great friend of the Holy Father. He is the chair of the Council on of Cardinals and been, has been a leader in environmental and economic justice. And he will be offering his reflections. Uh, we have two respondents. One is Edith Brown Weiss, a faculty member of the law school. It's a very distinguished record in international economic uh, environmental law. And John Podesta, who served as, who is affiliated with the law school and served as President Obama's environmental czar, although I'm sure he had a different title. But that is Monday, November 2nd at the Hart Auditorium in Georgetown University Law Center. For those of you who may be Latinos, that evening we're going to have an informal uh, discussion with Cardinal Rodriguez for Latino leaders under 40. Uh, we are going to check driver's licenses at the door. So uh, uh, you can't come, Cardinal. Uh, the, uh, maybe. Uh, but uh, we think this is a unique opportunity. It's part of our outreach to young leaders in Washington, uh, all of them, and especially Latinos. And we'll be having a salt and light gathering to reflect on the people visit uh, shortly. Final thing I want to do is thank the people who made this possible. First thing I want to say is how great it is to have Cardinal McCarrick here. He is <laughs> Uh, each of us could tell you stories about how he has supported our leadership. He has been particularly powerful in his support and helpful in support of the initiative. So it's just tremendous to have you with us. And the people who make this happen, Caitlin Devine, Angela Miller-McGraw, and Alyssa Fernandez actually did the work to make this possible. I want you to th thank them for their good work. I especially want to thank the students from Stone Ridge, from Georgetown Visitation, and the Academy of the Holy Cross for your presence here tonight. <laughs> and I want you and all of us to thank this wonderful panel. I, for one, am proud to be a part of a community that produces and follows leaders like these. Thank you very much.